But to all our viewers and uh, to our listeners that have been following us online, we welcome you once again into our family service here at Impact Family Church, East London, South Africa. Today, we celebrate five years old as a church, and we trust that you'll just enjoy the celebration with us, even online, as we just connect around God's Word. You know, church, if I look at when we started Impact Family Church five years ago, it, it, it was birthed out of crisis. It was birthed out of disappointment. It was birthed out of pain. It was birthed out of something that we felt was not fair. Something happened in our lives that rearranged our lives. It disrupted our lives. And we looked at it, and Valma and I many times said, it's not fair. But what God birthed out of it made it okay. So today I can say it's okay. You know, it was not fair, but it's okay because I've seen God's hand in it. And so how many times have you and I from young <laughs> said those words? It's not fair. We've gone to mom and said, well, why do you do that for Johnny and you don't do it for me, mom? It's not fair. And then we, we, we carry that same kind of approach into our marriage. You do, you do everything for the whole neighborhood, babe, but you don't do it for me. It's not fair. Then we go into the work environment that we've been slaving away faithfully for so many years. Some new starter comes in there, gets promotion, gets a bonus, and gets the position that you've been dreaming for. And then we leave there and we say, it's not fair. <laughs> But today we're going to understand that even when we feel it's not fair, God is able to help us to say it's okay. If we look at the definition of fairness this morning, and, and again, it's, it's subjective to context, but fairness simply means impartial and just treatment or behavior without favoritism or discrimination. How many times have you felt discriminated. You have felt mistreated. What has happened to you has been unjust. It's been partial. An element of favoritism has crept into the family, and they've overlooked me, and I feel left out. No one sees me. How many times have you felt no one sees you? You're going through the motions. You're giving your very best. You're, you're serving. You love, you're trying to love your family, and you wonder, do they see me washing the dishes? Do they see me cutting the grass? <laughs> do they see the long hours I put in, and then they still keep saying, don't you ever want to come home? But they don't see what I'm trying to do for the family. It, it's, not, it's not fair. And then, God, I'm serving you, but then I look at my neighbor Man, they live it up every weekend. I even hear the language that comes from there. They curse God and they're not dying. It's not fair. And then a week later, they drive in with their Mercedes Benz. It's not fair. Because your skudunk is heard from a mile away. But you love God and you honor God. And you see those that don't honor God. And they're getting away with murder. Literally murder. And we declare, it's not fair. And if we get caught up in this for too long, it will not be okay. And we're going to lose out of what God wants to do for us. So this morning, follow with me from Genesis chapter 16. I'm going to share three quick stories with you. And all three stories is about an individual who went through a time of experiencing life in an unfair way. Here we're going to speak about an employee Someone who worked for someone else and experienced mistreatment in the workplace. Someone who experienced discrimination. And can I just say from the outset that God has a heart for foreigners and strangers. God has a heart for orphans and God has a heart for widows. Because all three of those categories are individuals that have suffered an unfair moment in their life. They lost their husband or their wife. They lost their parent or they've lost their place where they grew up in and now find themselves in a foreign country. So God has a big heart for those three categories because today, widows, orphans, and foreigners are overlooked and discriminated. Someone say amen, because it's true. 
and it's unfair. But with God, it can become okay. So Genesis chapter 16 and verse 1. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, which means that in a community when a lady cannot bring forth children and is seen as barren, is seen as cursed. So she will walk through the community and the people will say, well, there's that woman who is cursed. She's an outcast in this community because she cannot bring forth children in her household. Let's continue. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Now, how did Hagar come into here? Yeah, Hagar is the employee. Sarai is the employer. Sarai is the mistress. And Hagar is serving the mistress as a slave in the house. Hagar, listen carefully, was Pharaoh's daughter. Do you remember a few chapters earlier where there was a famine in the land and Abraham and Sarah went down to Egypt and Abraham said to his, his wife, Sarah, listen, when you get there, just tell them that you're my sister, hey? Because if they know that you're my wife and you're so beautiful, then they're going to mistreat me. So they went in and, made, and, and, and brought a lie into Egypt that this is my sister. So you know what Pharaoh did? Pharaoh took Sarai, Abram's wife, into his harem, and she became one of his wives. And then later on, when Pharaoh gets to hear that Abram was lying, he says, why do you do this to me? I took your wife to become one of my wives because you told me she's your sister. Now get out of Egypt, take your wife, take all the belongings, and go. And you know what he gave Sarah? Sarah? Pharaoh gave his daughter Hagar. So Hagar was a princess in Egypt. She was a, a combination of both Egyptian and Mesopotamian. She would be seen as an African. She was dark in complexion, and so an African was in the mix. A foreigner in the house of a Jewish family. Are you with me? You need to hear the context here. Because Pharaoh believed it would be better for his daughter to be a slave in someone else's house than to be a mistress of her own house. So that means that here we've got Hagar as a daughter whose father didn't believe in her and didn't see her more than a servant. Can you imagine having a father who doesn't see a future for you? And says, you know, I'd rather sell you into slavery than allow you being the princess to have your own castle. So we must understand already, Hagar is serving in someone else's household as a foreigner, feeling rejected by her own father as a pharaoh who knew she was a princess, but did not want her to be acknowledged for it. And so she serves. And the word Hagar, the name Hagar means this. So Pharaoh actually gave this name to his daughter when his daughter came into the world. Your name will be Hagar, which means flight. That means when disaster hits, you're going to run. You're not going to be stable. You're not going to be strong. You're not going to be able to get through it. When crisis breaks out, you're going to run. You're going to take flight. Hagar also means forsaken, stranger, and a foreigner. Can you imagine carrying that name? So who are you? I'm Hagar. I'm a stranger. I am forsaken. No one sees me for who I am. Not even my own father sees me for who I am. Do you know, I, I, I was born into royalty. I'm a princess, but my father literally kicked me out the house and said, you know what, you don't deserve to be a mistress, but you deserve to serve a mistress. Can you imagine how she must have felt unloved and devalued? And now she goes and serves Sarai. So she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having children. <laughs> Sarah had a problem with God. How many times have we had a problem with God? Don't look all holy right now, okay? Let's be honest. There were moments when you shouted a little bit at God, that volume control went up, or you gave God the silent treatment. I'm not talking to you right now. And so she had a bit of an issue with God because she says, the Lord has kept me from having children. He is to be blamed. So he goes, she, she says to her husband, Abraham, go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Oh, my word. How many times have you felt like you were a, a piece of scaffolding in people's hands? They use you to get to the heights they want to touch, and when they get there, they take you down and you go back to the storeroom. 
So Sarai looks at her servant, Hagar, and says, you are going to be a stepping stone in my journey. I'm going to use you to start my household. And you have no say in the matter because as a servant in the house, as a slave in the house, you have no say. How many times have you said, it's not fair. It's like I have no say in this marriage. It's like I have no say in this business. I have no say in this church. I have no say in this country. It's not fair. I am very sure many times Hagar went to bed at night saying, this is not fair. I belong in a palace. I am Pharaoh's daughter. I was born into royalty. It's not fair that my father cursed me from a birth by giving me a name of being forsaken, being a stranger, and I will always take flight. Doesn't he believe in me? Doesn't he see who I can be? And now I'm serving a mistress who still doesn't see me for who I am, but sees me for what I can give her. But let me also tell you this little element to the story. Sarai was very sneaky. Because if a lady is barren and cannot produce kids, the problem is in two areas. Either it's with her, Oh, it's the husband. So she says, I got a plan. Because I've heard the voices in this community that has scorned me. They have declared that I'm an outcast. They have declared that I'm an unfit wife because I cannot give my husband children. So I'm going to make a declaration to this community. It's not my fault. It's my husband. So watch, I am going to give this young good-looking slave girl to him because my husband's old. And the potential for him, to, to, for her to fall now pregnant, is, it, it's, it's very bleak. And so when she doesn't fall pregnant, everyone will then say, you see, you see, you see, the problem is not Sarai, the problem is Abram. Because I can imagine even Sarai was walking around one day saying, it's not fair. My husband and I have tried the bedroom scene. We've tried everything that can be done. It ain't working. It's not fair. Do you know, a lot of people who feel mistreated, if they don't know how to deal with their mistreatment, end up mistreating others because hurting people hurt people. Are you with me? So she came up with a plan. I'm going to show the world it's not me. It's my husband. So she says to her husband, go sleep with my slave girl. Now, if Abram was the head of the home, as he should have been, he would have said, baby, I'm not interested in any other woman but you. But yes, ma'am, I will submit to you. So Abram agreed to what Sarah said. Verse 3. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. Don't you think that that is so unfair? Here's a young lady who's, I'm surely got dreams in her own life to meet the love of her life. The prince in shining armor. And now she looks at this old man and has no choice in it, but has to be his wife. And not just have to be his wife. But I've got to go and be intimate with a man that I'm not in love with. I've got to go be intimate with a man that is so old and it's not going to be easy going in that bedroom scene. Do you know I had dreams about who could be my husband one day? Not this guy. And I've got no say in it. Can anyone see my, my pain? Can anyone see what I'm going through? Because it looks like no one sees me, and it looks like everyone's about their own agenda and forgetting that, excuse me, I'm in the mix here. So Abraham slept with Hagar, and she conceived. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah, your plan just blew up. Come on now, that old man, he made it happen. He went to bed with her, and she's now pregnant. So who's got the problem? Oh, Sarai, it looks like the problem could maybe be with you. So when she knew she was pregnant, Hagar, that is, she began to despise her mistress. I need you to understand the story of Hagar this morning more than anything else because I believe we've got some people in here that are going to relate to the story. 
Hagar is saying, I really don't want to fall pregnant. I don't have a choice. I had to marry this man. I don't have a choice. I had to sleep with this man. But I'm praying, please, God, I don't want to be a mother right now. I'm young. I don't want to nurse a child right now. I don't want to restrict my social life. I don't want to restrict my dreams. I have to become a mother not by choice, but by force. This is called abuse. This is called mistreatment. This is unfair. This is discrimination. Is it because of my color? Is it because I am an African in your house that you think you can just abuse me and abuse me? Can you understand what was going through Hagar is actually what's happening around the world today? And so she started to despise her mistress. So Sarah, you know what? Your plan is really blowing up in your face right now. Firstly, the problem's not your husband. Secondly, hey, you got a baby in the mix, but it's not yours biologically. It's from a slave girl who now hates you and despises you, and the atmosphere in the house is no longer pleasant. Guess what, Sarai? You have brought it into play. But instead of her owning up to it, this is what Sarai says to her husband. <laughs> you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. How many of us started a family and the first child came into the mix? And in the beginning, it was like, oh, look at our baby boy. And then later on, life happens. And baby boy ain't always baby boy. And then suddenly the husband says to the, it's your child. It's your child. Your child. Not mine. Your child. Take your child. Discipline your child. Look at what your child is doing. It's your child. This is not fair. It's not me. It's you. It's your genes. <laughs> so Sarah comes and says, ah, it's you. But yes. You tell me I must sleep with her. You tell me I must be her husband. I also don't want to be someone else's husband. But it looks like you just want to be pleased. And now you're still not happy. It's not. I've tried everything. And it's not fair. So Sarah said, I put my slave into your arms. And now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. It's not fair. But in this case, Sarah can you take some responsibility? Now, a lot of us sometimes hide behind that statement, it's not fair, and it will never be okay because we've never taken responsibility for our actions. And the day that we can learn to take responsibility and say, Lord, what I am suffering now is the consequences of my own actions, stop saying it's not fair, rather say it's my fault. Because if you can own up that it's your fault, it will become okay. Amen? It's very quiet here suddenly. It's okay. The birthday feast is coming. Then she says, may the Lord judge between you and me. Oh, suddenly you're becoming so spiritual now. It's funny how we bring the Lord into the picture of our conversations when things are not going according to our way and by blaming others and say, well, I guess the Lord will have to judge between you and me. Instead of just saying, you know what, it's me. So Abraham starts playing the game, and he says, no, 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 your slave is in your hands. You're the mistress, she's your slave, she's in your hands. Abraham said, do with her whatever you think best. Faisal, come here quickly. Anyone watching us online, he's not single, he's taken. <laughs> so this is Hagar. Quite a good looking Hagar. <laughs> Oh, there you go. <laughs> so it's like Sarah is saying, Abraham, it's your business. Abraham says, no, 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 no. She's yours. She says, just remember who cooks the meals in this house. She's yours, Abraham. <laughs> Abraham says, hey, listen, you told me to go and sleep with her. She's yours, man. How many of you here today feel like your every day is in someone else's hands? That your husband is... <laughs> Thanks, Vezo, you can take a seat. Your husband is shoving you around by his comments. Your children are shoving you around by their comments. Your neighbors are shoving you around because they think they're better than you. You get to work and no one sees you. You're making the coffee and no one says thank you to you. But all they're doing is pushing you from A to B, from B to A, and no one is seeing you for who you are. I know what's going through all your minds right now. He said we're going to have three stories. He's still in story one. <laughs> so can I just calm the atmosphere? 
I'm only going to give you story one. But I will give you story two next week. And we'll carry on with this amazing story because I believe there's a lot in this that you and I are going to learn and something's going to unlock in this time of fasting and praying because a lot of us believe that we are not being seen for who we are. And a lot of us are walking around with pain, hurt, and unresolved issues and still saying it's unfair, unfair, unfair. A lot of us have experienced abuse and mistreatment from parents, from loved ones, from colleagues, from friends and neighbors, and we haven't yet been able to walk out the forgiveness. We're still bitter, but we've got the bitter smile. I don't like you. That's called the bitter smile. I hate you. I wish you weren't here. And everyone's deceived by the smile, but the heart is still aching. So don't worry. We're going to have a feast real soon. Everyone happy now? Amen. amen. Yeah, you didn't give me an amen just now, huh? Now that you're getting a shorter one, you're getting an amen. I'm <laughs> just joking. <laughs> it's not fair. Okay. <laughs> Then Sarai mistreated Hagar. Do you see that? If you get mistreated, you mistreat even further. So she flees from Hagar, takes flight. Hagar still starts to live out the curse. She starts to live out what her father said. That's what you're going to do. That when crisis comes your way, you're going to flee. You're going to take flight. She starts to live out the curse. How many of us sometimes are living out the curse of what people have spoken over us? You will never be clever. You will be stupid for the rest of your life. You're not beautiful. You're not pretty. You're not intellectual. Just take it that this is how it's going to be. And then you become it because you believe that's all that you can be. And then you take that upon yourself. So she flies. She flees. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, listen carefully, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? How many questions were asked there? Two questions. Where have you come from and where are you going? And she says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Did she answer both questions? She only answered one. And we are all guilty of always answering that same question. When people ask you, so why are you running from your marriage? Why are you running from this business? Why are you running from this situation? Why are you trying to escape the crisis? Why? And we all come back and we know how to answer where we have come from. I can tell you the betrayals in my life. I can tell you the deceit. I can tell you who's lied. I can tell you who's hurt me. I can tell you all the pain of rejection and all those broken moments. I know where I've come from. But if I don't know how to deal with my past, I will never know where I'm going towards. So Sarah, where are you going? I don't know. All I know is I'm running away from something, but I have no idea what I'm running towards. And I'm praying that over the next few weeks and months that we are going to start finding direction in our lives because, you know, I don't want to run away. I want to run away from what it used to be, but I want to run towards something. Where have you come from? I've come from a mistreated place. I come from a place where my own father didn't see potential in me. I'm a princess, but slave, just sewed me into slavery. To a mistress, that lives a life based on her agenda and her wants, Don't, not seeing me for who I am and throwing me around. I feel like a piece of scaffolding in her hands. Where have you come from? I'm running away from it. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. I need you to get this end of the story before we close. Go back to your mistress. Let me say this to you. You may experience an injustice, but an injustice does not give you and I the freedom to become rebellious. We can experience mistreatment in the workplace, mistreatment in the home, mistreatment in the community. It does not give us the right to break the rules. And a lot of people today are walking around breaking the rules because they think they have the right to break the rules because someone has broken their lives. And that doesn't make it right. And we have got to learn to move from it's not fair to saying it's okay and I'm going to do it the right way. And she wasn't doing it the right way. She was still an employee. You can't just abscond and leave and flee. You still work for a lady. You've got to go back. 
Because if you don't leave the right way, when you walk into your next season, you will walk in the wrong way. The way you end will determine how you start in your next season. So I need you to go back and submit. And you've heard me say this before. Submission is not practiced in agreement. It's practiced in a place of disagreement. Because if you're, if you're in agreement, you're not submitting to anything. It's when you disagree, when you say, my husband, you know, you, you're not fair. But I guess I've still got to submit to you, old man. You know, parents, I don't agree how you do things, but I guess I'm under your roof, so I guess I've got to submit. I don't agree with my employer. I don't like the way my boss operates and how my manager operates. But I guess, you know what, I'm not in his role. I work for him. I guess I've got to learn to submit. Because let me tell you, when the Christian learns to submit, submission attracts the blessings and the breakthroughs of God in our lives. But so often we experience such mistreatment and such pain that we just want to run, but we don't realize we're actually fleeing out of rebellion and out of bitterness and out of hurt. So when you walk into your next environment, you take all that rebelliousness. And the Bible says rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. So all that oppressive attitude and oppression that's been on you, you take it with you into your brand new season, and guess what? In your brand new season, you're just reliving your history. Go back, and I want you to clear up the matter there so when you move forward, you don't see through the lens of yesterday's pain. You don't see through the lens of yesterday's betrayal. You don't look at your new through the eyes of the old and then miss out on what God wants to birth in your life. So, hey, God, I know this is going to be hard. I know that I'm asking you to face your pain. And I'm asking you to face all that bitterness. And I'm asking you to face all the betrayal. I know you have to face being pushed around and shoved around. And you're going to face up to that curse that was placed on your life by your dad. They didn't see anything good in you. I need you to go back because if you don't go back, you can't go forward. And then the angel said, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. There will be a blessing. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. And Ishmael means God hears. Oh, isn't God beautiful? You're going to have a son, and you're going to give the son his name? Ishmael. Listen carefully. Because Ishmael means God hears. And every time you nurse that baby, and every time you hold that baby, I want you to remember that God hears. Some of you got to hear that this morning because some of you have questioned, is God hearing my crying? Is God hearing my prayers? Is God hearing what I am speaking to him about? Does God see me? Many people will say, God doesn't hear me because they don't believe God sees them. So I need you to know that God has heard you. And every time you said, it's not fair, God heard you. Hey, God. And I'm going to turn this around for you. For the Lord has heard your misery. He has heard those words. It's not fair. So she gave the name to the Lord who spoke to her. And Hagar actually gives a name to God. I mean, what? And calls God El Roy. For she said, I have now seen the one Sees me. I have finally found someone who sees me for who I am. My father didn't see me. My mistress didn't see me. That old man that slept with me didn't see me. No one is seeing me. But now I've collided with the God of the universe, the one who has seen me because he has heard me and he has now seen me. That is why the well was called Belaroi, well of the living, the one who sees me. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. Next Sunday, I will speak to you about a second story, an, an amazing story of someone else. And in this case, it wasn't an employee. It was a mother and a father trying to deal with tragedy and also trying to make sure how to get through it in a way that made it okay. Let's bow our heads together.